One in the Old Testament, one in the New Testament, Philippians chapter 1, verse 20, Proverbs chapter 24, verse 14. This is the fourth part. It's actually the end. It's the conclusion to our four-part series on reaping. And we're going to go ahead and release middle school students. If we have middle school students in the room, you can follow along with uh, Paul right over here in the side room. And they teach this teaching that I'm preaching here in the sanctuary. They teach it to the middle schoolers right on their own level. And uh, we appreciate Paul uh, doing that. I want to say this while you're finding these passages. We're excited about what God has been doing at Family First for the last number of weeks and months. How many have processed through Growth Track and you're a dream teamer? Can I see your hand? You've been through Growth Track. There's four classes and you're a dream teamer. We've uh, not doing dream team Growth Track this week because of the Thanksgiving holiday. So then next Wednesday night will be week number three, which is on developing your leadership. And then the first week of December will actually be week number four. We got off track because of the holiday coming up on Thursday. We're a week behind. And then we'll not be processing uh, growth track through the rest of December, but we'll restart in January. I want to say this, and I talked to a bunch of our leaders last week. We had a meeting and we were praying together. I want to say this very quickly, but it's very important. I know that we're processing through this structure. There's a, a system that God has given us. There's an idea to take people through four classes to get them the vision to serve here at Family First as a member of the Dream Cream. And that's kind of a process. There's a structure, there's a system to that. But let it suffice to say from my heart, hear it from me first. There is nothing that has changed. There is nothing that will ever change in the philosophy at Family First that we believe it is by the power of God that God changes a person's life. There's no substitute. We can't educate people into the kingdom. We can't train people into serving God. We cannot process them through structure. It's not by might nor by power, but by, oh, it's getting kind of quiet here in this Presbyterian church this morning. I said it's by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. Family first will always be a Holy Spirit filled church. Turn to your neighbor and say, pastor has structure, pastor has order, there is process, there are programs that are in place, but it does not substitute for the moving of the Holy Spirit of God. If you're in agreement with me, then come on, give the Lord a hand clap of praise this morning and celebrate that God's power and an I tell you, the anointing of the Spirit of God is all over this place right now. It's so powerful in this room. I, I don't know if I'm honored to be able to, to preach, but I'm going to do my best. <laughs> you found two passages of Scripture, Philippians chapter 1, Proverbs chapter 24. While you're finding those, this series has been about reaping. I've been sharing my heart about you reaping, gathering, uh, receiving, gathering the increase that God has in store for your life. Many of us in the body of Christ are great souls. We're great givers. We are great at giving to the Lord, but we're not so good at receiving. There are reasons we've been trying to deal with some of those. Reaping is the second half of the kingdom law of sowing and reaping. The Bible says it's the law of sowing and reaping. Genesis chapter 8 verse 22 says, While the earth remains seed time and harvest, day and night, summer and winter shall not cease. There are two parts of the process that God wants to bring increase in your life. You've got to be a sower, but you've also got to be a reaper. You've got to believe in seed time, but you've also got to believe in harvest. So I've been expressing my heart in this series about reaping so that you can receive, so that you can have increase. How many want more? Can I see your hand? You want to have more. You want to provide for others. You want God to bless you, not so that you can have stuff, not so that you can pair yourself with somebody else, someone that wanders into Family First might get the idea that Family First is a prosperity church. I'm glad you've got that notion. Come on, somebody. Pastor Coates, are you a prosperity preacher? Oh, you better believe I'm a prosperity preacher. But prosperity is not having stuff. It's having much more than enough to fulfill my assignment on the earth so that I can help others fulfill their assignment. Prosperity is not about comparison. It's not about cars and homes and diamonds. It's about seeing the kingdom of God advance in the earth in these days for the glory of God. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap of praise here this morning. And so you've got to be a reaper. You've got to be a receiver. You see, there's three foundational statements, and I've said these repetitively. I'm going to say them again this morning. I know I'm saying them again. I'm not getting so old that I don't remember I'm repeating myself. But repetition is a good teacher. So here's the three statements. Number one, Everything that God does, He does 
through a seed. Everything he creates, everything he grows, everything he increases, everything that he multiplies, it happens through the seed. Within the seed of every living thing is the pre-programmed DNA which causes that thing to enable to reproduce itself. That's the seed. It's, it's a miracle. The second statement then is just as powerful. You are a walking dispenser of seed. There are things in you, everything that you currently have can be sown into the life of someone else. You can give other people love. You can give them mentorship. You can give them encouragement. You can give them forgiveness. You can sow things in the lives of the other people that are in your life. In fact, I don't know if I've emphasized this as strong as I want to, but God already has placed everything in your life that you need to create the future that you desire. What is the vision for your life tomorrow? What is the vision for your life in the next week, the month, next, for 10 years from now? Some people say, well, Pastor Coach, I don't even know what I'm going to be doing tomorrow. You know, Japanese corporations have a 100-year game plan, and most Christians don't even know where they're going to have lunch this afternoon on, on Sunday. You need to get God's vision for your life and realize that everything you need to create the future that you desire is already in your life right now. You have the mind of Christ. Turn to your neighbor and say, I've got the mind of Christ. You have the power of the Holy Spirit. You have the faith that God has given you. To every man, there is given the measure of faith. You've got enough faith inside of you already. You say, Pastor Coates, how much is a measure? A measure is just enough. But as you sow it, the little bit is going to become greater. You see, the seed that God already... how oh, I'm into this thing right now. Come on. I just want to get a hold of this. I want to communicate to this to you. Some people think that... My harvest is going to come out of the heavens. God is just going to supernaturally give me a college degree. He's just going to supernaturally give me the job of my dreams. He's just going to supernaturally put me in a perfect relationship. No, probably none of that's going to magically happen. But it's all going to systematically happen when I take what he has already given me in my life and I sow it toward the expected result of God's faithfulness in my life. Everybody doing okay here this morning? Say amen. So everything that God does, he does from the seed. You're a walking dispenser of seeds and the seed is the key to your future. Now, I've been teaching about reaping because that's the second part of the harvest. And it's the often overlooked part of the harvest. We talked about sowing a lot. But we also need to talk about reaping. In the first Sunday when I laid this foundation, I asked the question. Now, how many have discovered by now that Pastor Coates asks trick questions? <laughs> you don't want to say amen at the wrong time. How many have ever been in a service and you've said amen at the wrong time and everybody else kind of looks at you like, like you, you just fell off the, the log? You know, <laughs> Don't say amen at the wrong time. I got to hurry. But have you also noticed that people can be led so easily? Oh, yeah. I mean, it all depends not on what you say, but the way you say it. I could say something that was ludicrous. Now, I'm not going to because I think that words are important. I could say something false. I could say something that's not true. I could say something that is absolutely opposed to biblical truth. But if I said it with the right amount of addiction and I said, can everybody here in this room shout a hallelujah? You would do so. Just out of automatic response. So you don't say amen at the wrong time. But let me ask you this question. Is the harvest automatic? See, you've learning. Turn to your neighbor and say you're a good listener. If you say no, the harvest is not automatic. What are you saying? You're saying, Pastor, I don't believe the word of God. The Bible says give and it shall be given to you. The Bible says seed, time, and harvest. Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. If you don't believe the harvest is automatic, then you're denying the reality of the word of God. Now let's flip that around. But if you say, no, the harvest is not automatic, or it is automatic, what are you saying? You're taking yourself and your responsibilities and your uh, requirements out of the scenario. So here's what I've come up with. The harvest may be automatic, but you have to choose to become a reaper. It's out there. The money does grow on trees. <laughs> the citrus farmers in Central Florida know that. Money grows on trees. Contrary to what your parents have told you all of your formative years, money does grow on trees. But even though it's growing on trees, literally that's true. 
because you have to cut down a tree, you have to process the paper, you have to turn it into cellulose, they have to put it in a printing press, you have to put green ink on it, and then the, the, the paper that grew on a tree becomes money that you have in your pocket. Money does grow on trees. But you do have to go out and collect it. You do have to go out and receive it. So what I'm trying to emphasize for you is how to be a reaper. And I want to hurry today because there's three parts that make up the real you. You consist of your mind, your will, and your emotions. And if you've been with us in previous weeks, we've talked each of the last two weeks on one of these points. We talked about the mind. Last Sunday, we talked about the will. Today, we're going to talk about the emotions, which is actually the heart, the center of your passions and your desires. And if you weren't with us, I'll give you a quick review so you don't miss out. The mind has to be fully engaged in receiving. You are not going to be a reaper. You're not going to experience prosperity. You're not going to walk in increase until you get the mind of a receiver until you begin to think until you begin to embrace your divinely inspired self portrait and realize that you deserve more because God created you in his image you're not junk you're created in the image of God and you are a person of sacred worth and importance and God wants to put more in your life and you've got to act and think like the mind of a receiver if you can't think it you will not experience it But you've got to think like the mind of a receiver. You say, Pastor Coach, you preach like that at Family First all the time. What will people think? You know what I believe? If you can get people to think at all, it's a major miracle. (laughs) So begin to think like a receiver. The mind of a receiver. And then you secondly have to have the will. We talked about this last Sunday. You have to have the will to what? You have to have the will to endure. You have to persevere. Galatians 6, 9, let us not grow weary of doing well. For in due season we will reap if we do not give up, if we do not throw in the towel. So many don't understand that there's a process in this thing. And I know that these words come out really fast, but I want you to really think with me. If you'll process your mind, your will, and your emotions, all three of those things have to be connected into your process of being a receiver. You have to think like a receiver. That's the mind. But you have to have the will to endure. How many know it's going to take some willpower to get through the harvest? I remember that little seed we planted last Sunday morning. That little corn seed. Remember we put it in that, in that little bowl of uh, dirt and then we poured water on it. That little seed would have to endure until the harvest comes. If that's out in the real world, there's going to be some wind and some rain that's going to come against that seed. The seed is going to try to get crowded out by the weeds. There's going to have to be some cultivation. There's going to have to be some pesticides sprayed. There's going to have to be some bugs that are gotten out of the way. There's going to have to be some endurance because that little seed is not going to automatically pop up and produce a stalk unless it gets a heart of endurance. And you have got to get a will to endure. Oh, I'm on this like I was last Sunday morning, if you remember. God deliver us from mamby, pamby, mealy mouth, wishy-washy wannabe Christians that got no willpower. They have no spine of an amoeba or the strength of an of a, of a, idiot to to stand strong and believe that God is going to help them endure until the harvest comes. But here's the third one I'm dealing with today, and I've got to get into this so that I can give you the message. It's a mind to receive, a will to endure, but you have to have what? We talk about the emotions, but I'm going to use the word heart. The word emotions is a little bit too, too flighty. It's, it's a little bit too, too far out there. If we get emotional here this morning, we'll lose 50% of you. So we're going to talk about the heart. That's the center of your passions and your desires. You have to have a heart, and I want you to connect with me. Your heart has to be steadfast. Your heart has to be centered. It has to be non-wavering. It cannot be double-minded. Perhaps double-mindedness is nowhere apparent, more apparent in the life of most Christians than in this area of waiting for their financial harvest. James says, when anyone asks of God, let him believe and not doubt. For anyone who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. Your heart has to be steadfast. You have to have your emotions reined into control. You have to have your steadfastness and your determination 
salvation centered and it's going to keep you on task until the harvest comes. And the key that I'm going to help you with today to maintain the steadfastness of your heart. How many times have you read in the Bible that the people of the Lord had a heart of steadfastness? David, his heart was fixed before God. He was steadfast before the Lord. You know what that means? It means he was not driven by his emotions. He was not driven by his feelings. Someone asked me the other day, they said, Pastor Coates, do you sing? Feelings, nothing more than feelings. Trying to forget my feelings of love. Yeah, I sing. I sing to an audience of one on some occasions. And we make some pretty beautiful music together, but we're not going to go there right now. But, you know, let me, let me, get, let me get back, let me get back to, to the point. Your emotions, your feelings can't control you. If you live your life by your feelings, your heart is not steadfast and you're going to give up on your harvest before it ever arrives. Because sometimes you don't even feel saved. I know I'm preaching a lot better than you're shouting right now. Turn to your neighbor and say, he's talking about you right now. Sometimes you don't look saved. Sometimes you don't feel saved. And sometimes I wonder if you are saved. But the word of God says, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just. So I'm saved and I'm and I'm forgiven even when I don't feel like it. Because that's what the word of God says. Rain your emotions in. And you do that. Look at this word we're going to talk about today. It's a word expectation. The thing that's going to keep your heart steadfast is what I'm going to tell and explain to you today, expectation. There's two passages of scripture. I had you turn to those. Philippians chapter 1 and Proverbs chapter 24. Look at these. Philippians 1. And it is my eager, say it with me church, expectation and hope. That I will not all be ashamed, but that with, with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. Paul said, I've got an eager expectation. Now, here's what it says in Proverbs 24, 14. So shall the knowledge of wisdom be unto thy soul. And when thou hast found it, there shall be a reward. Now, let me track you with this. There's wisdom. And wisdom will produce the knowledge and the knowledge will bring a reward into your life. And what will the reward will, will be? The reward will be thy expectation that shall not be cut off. So expectation, it's powerful. It will keep you on a heart of steadfastness. If you walk and live in expectation, your feelings aren't going to control you. The opinions of other people aren't going to manipulate you. The way of the tide of public opinion is not going to persuade you because your heart is fixed before the Lord. Your heart is steadfast because you know that you know that you know that you know. I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day because my heart is full of expectation. So what is it? Well, if you look at the dictionary, if you Googled dictionary.com, not right now, but if you, if you do Google dictionary.com, expectation is the act or the state of expecting to wait in anticipation or expectation. But there's more than that when you put it in the Bible context. It's like hope, but it's more than hope. How many know hope's a good thing? The Bible says, Hebrews 11, 1, now faith is the substance of what? Things hoped for. I can't teach on faith right now. That's another Sunday. But you can't have faith unless you start with hope. And hope is the impartation of God's predicted preferred future in your life. And if you can get a vision for what God has for you in the days to come, that's going to be your hope. But your hope, when it's put on steroids, when it's brought to a level of exponential growth, hope can become an expectation. Because Expectation is stronger than hope. It's more, it's not abstract. It's not wishy. It's not fantasizing. It's not a premonition. It is a tangible, powerful, practical, powerful thing in your life. Let me illustrate this and teach you in Acts chapter 3. Now, you don't necessarily need to turn there. We'll have a verse on the screen in a minute. Acts chapter 3, Peter and John. Remember the story? They're at the temple. They're getting ready to go in the gate called Beautiful. And there's a lame man there. And the Bible says that they were going up, Acts chapter 3, verse 1, about the 
ninth hour, and a lame man from birth being carried, whom they lay daily at the gate of the temple that is called the beautiful gate, asking alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive them alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and they said what? Look at us. Peter and John gave this man a divine instruction. Divine instructions are going to want the release of the miracles of God in your life. Come on, I'm preaching a lot better than your, your... Listen to this. Divine instructions are the indication that a miracle is just about ready to happen. Now look at this verse, verse number five. This is the man. Peter and John said, look at us. Divine instruction. He fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. Their eyes met. You ever meet somebody? Talk to them? Their eyes connect with your eyes. And all of a sudden, he is like, wow, something is happening here. And the scripture says he was expecting to receive something from them. I'm not trying to impress you this morning. I'm just trying to teach you. The Greek word there for expecting to receive something from him is the Greek prosdokeo. And I'm not sure of the pronunciation, but that's not important. What's important is this Greek word literally means to attentively look toward something with your neck stretched out and your heart thrust forward. We had a good time here about a couple of hours ago trying to explain this. Expectation is when you're creating your neck, looking forward to see what God is going to do next in your life. Have you ever stretched your neck out to what God is going to do next in your life? How many know what I'm talking about? God is going to show up and you're not going to miss it. So you're creaning your neck. Come on, practice with me. Just kind of get your, get your stretch going. Come on, work out your faith. Uh, I, I'm creaning my neck. And then the scripture says, and your heart thrusts forward. I'm not only creaning my neck to see what God is going to do next, but I'm pushing my heart. I'm pushing my chest into my future because my eyes have connected with the one that has given me a divine instruction. And I'm anticipating that God is going to do something miraculous in my my life and you know what I've got an expectation and you can't steal my expectation from me my, my feelings can't steal my expectations from me the devils in hell can't take my expectation from me all the haters on the earth can't take my expectation from me it's in my spirit by the power of God through divine instruction and I'm craning my neck forward in faith in what God is going to do next so he fixed his eyes Expecting Now here's what Jeremiah says. Somebody's going to shout in this Baptist church. I'm telling you what, it's going to shout today whether you want to or not. Jeremiah 29 11. How many know Jeremiah 29 11? And these are the plans. Let me give you two in the King James. The thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. Here's what it says in the Amplified. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you. Was that this service, Pastor Omar, you talked about? That God could not get the people out of his mind. And that's what kept him on the cross. Because he looked and he saw you and me being transformed from sin by the power that he was providing through his shed blood. Through the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expectation. And again, I'm trying to impress you this morning. But the Hebrew word there, expectation, is a word that's spelled T I K W or, or T I K V A W, Tikva. And you know what that word can literally in other places of the Bible be translated a cord or a string or a rope. In other words, God can give you something called an expectation. Oh, get a hold of this. And you can use that cord to lasso your hopes, lasso your dreams, and get connected to them. And they'll pull you into your future. How many have ever heard vision statements? And vision statements like it's telling you everything you got to do and you feel like you're worn out. And you feel like you got to try harder and do better. And it's like you got to be pushed for your dream. No, expectation isn't requiring me to be pushed towards my dream. It gives me a divine cord that I can wrap around my 
my destiny. And now I've got something connected with my future and it's pulling me forward. It's pulling me into the vision of the future that God has for my life. And that's my divine expectation. And that's going to keep my heart steadfast. My feelings are going to falter. My impressions are going to fade. Other people are going to try to discourage me. But I've got a divine cord wrapped around my divine expectation. And it's going to pull me into the vision of the future. Because I'm going to reap the harvest of my reward. Because of the faithfulness of God. So how many will want to learn how to keep your expectation alive? How many know what's, oh, i got to hurry here, but how many know what it's like to have a dream die? I know you may not want to raise your hand. That's okay. I understand. I preach to your hearts. That's okay. If you've had a dream and that dream has died, you know what I'd do? I'd pray that God would resurrect that dead dream. If you had a dream for a business, maybe you tried to start a business and that business failed, you know what I'd do? I'd ask God for another divine instruction and I'd start another business. I'd ask God to tweak a little bit of the business schedule, tweak a little bit of the business plan so that this time it's successful by the anointing of God. And any dead dream that has died can be resurrected by the power of God. Dr. Mike Murdoch, a mentor in my life, he says that in his books, he says that most people's dreams die at least three or four times before they ever experience experience the miraculous fulfillment if your dream has died that doesn't mean your dream is over it doesn't mean that God doesn't have a dream for you it means that you need to dream again it means that you need to get a new vision get a new expectation get a new confidence that God is all God is in the process of specializing things that once died and he does something that's called resurrection and my Bible says if that same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead dwells in you it'll quicken your mortal body by his spirit that lives into and God can resurrect your dead dream and make it alive again. Amen. God's resurrected. Oh, I got to hurry here. I'm just trying to be personal with you. God's resurrected a few dead dreams in my life. He's resurrected about three times here in Spring Hill, Florida. I'm not, I'm not t- telling you anything you don't know. I'm just preaching the truth. You come in with great expectation, with great vision and great dreams. And you see God working and the devil tries to throw a monkey wrench in it. The devil tries to get you defeated. And you begin to think, well, I guess this isn't ever going to come to pass. But you know what I've discovered? I've discovered if you get in the altar of God and you pray through, not just get through praying, but you pray through until God opens the windows of heaven. And you remember that little seed? Oh, somebody get a hold of this. That little seed that we planted last Sunday morning in that soil... And then we watered it with our tears of intercession. And the tears of the intercession, they attracted the thunder clouds of heaven. And then the millions of tiny raindrops that begin to fall on a 10 acre field. That begin to vibrate that soil. Cause that seed that was down underneath the soil to say something's moving. Something's shaken. something stirred in the atmosphere. The time of my germination is just about at hand. Cause that old crusty seed coat is getting ready to bust off of me. And that embryo that's on the inside of me. It's going to swell up with new moisture and new vitality. It's going to burst forth into a resurrection and it's going to put out a radical root. And that radical root is going to burst down out of me and it's going to go down in the soil and it's going to be looking for one thing. It's going to be looking for water because demons like arid places, but the Spirit of God is the watering Spirit of the living God. He doesn't dwell in dead dry places. He dwells in places where is the living water. And your Bible says, I'm not where I'm sa- no why I'm saying all this but somebody get a hold of it in John chapter 7 on the last and greatest day of the feast on the last day he says I'll pour out the windows of heaven and out of your inmost being out of your belly there will come up a living artesian well of water and you'll be watering other people because of the water of God's spirit that's living inside of you my expectation is going to stay alive I got to get to the point here this morning I got four things I'm going to give you I'll do them quickly. Four things that you've got to do to keep expectation alive. How many have heard about keeping hope alive? Here's keeping expectation alive. Number one, I'll move quickly. Number one, your expectation must be clearly seen. Your expectation must be clearly seen. You must envision it. You must see the harvest that you are trying to reap. One of the greatest tools that have ever been revealed to me through mentors in my life is to help people schedule the harvest of God in their life. They've got to see it to believe it. I know that we ought to be able to believe it to see it. 
but most of us have to see it to believe it. And if I can somehow get you to see, if I can create a picture in your mind to get you to see that the best is yet to come, that the You're the head and not the tail. That God has a future and a destiny for you. If I can get you to see it in the eye of your heart, then your spirit will embrace it and you'll receive it. Put up the book of Ephesians for me. Is it chapter 1? Chapter 1, verse 18. Look at this verse. Read it with me. I'm going to slow down. Having the eyes of your hearts enlightened so that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. And more the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. What am I teaching about this morning? The heart. A heart of expectation. We dealt with the mind. Last week we dealt with the will. Today we're talking about the heart. And what does Paul say? That the eyes of your hearts. The center of your passions and desires. The eyes, that's a literal weird in the Greek. It's the word ophthalmic. It's like the word ophthalmologist, ophthalmology. And it refers to the eyes. But it's not the eyes of your mind. Get this. It's the eyes of your heart. It's not the eyes to your brain. It's the eyes to the center of your passions and your desires. That the eyes of your heart might be what? Enlightened. You know what that word is in the Greek text? It's the word photizo. It's like photograph. And you know what it literally means? It literally means... The light from an outside source has to come through so that the dream, the eyes of your heart can be enlightened by the light of God so that you can capture the vision that God has for you of your harvest. I want you to see this is it's powerful. God says, just like a photograph has to be, you know, old school, whether you've got the old camera with the, the film. And how many remember the Instamatics? And how many remember the old Magic Cubes? And how many remember the 35 millimeter films in the can? And, you know, you had to, you had to take them to Walmart or, or Kmart or Walgreens. And you wait five or six days and you get your pictures. And then they invented 24 hour development. And we thought we were in the light, you know, the light age we thought this was in now of course it's digital but whether it's old school new school process is the same what has to happen is the lens has to focus on the image that you want preserved and then once the image is focused by the lens the shutter has to open and when the shutter has opens what happens light floods in and the light whether it's old school is captured on the negative that's there on the back of the camera or whether it's applied digitally in the in the electronics of the of the ram of that camera with the megapixels of data the image that's revealed by the light that gets turned on is captured so that you can reproduce this image anytime you want to once you got it on paper my wife loves to print them out on paper and I understand why because you can put them in photo books and you don't have to worry about trying to find where that picture is in the phone you don't have to worry about if that picture got deleted you can go to the book and the book is cataloged I want to see the pictures of the miracles of God that happened in my life in 2005 I just go to the page that's marked 2005 and five and there's the miracle of the vision of God that's in my life and I can recall that and I can re-envision and I can see it all over again because it's been captured the eyes of my heart have been enlightened and the Holy Spirit has put in my memory banks a forever memory of the miracles of God because I've got an expectation I can see it and if I can see it I can believe it because it's going to bring me into the future that God has for me I'm going to hurry on this morning, but not only must you have a clear vision of your expectation, your expectation, secondly, has to be firmly believed. Now, is it okay if I just preach here this morning? Before I do that, I've got to wipe my face here for a second. I'm starting to perspire here in this cold church. But if I've got a vision of my expectation, I also have to firmly believe my expectation. Now, I'm going to meddle with you for just a minute because I know there's always a possibility. I'm not feeling any pushback. I don't ever feel pushback here at Family First, but I know there might possibly be a few people occasionally that would say, Pastor Coates, I'm not really sure I believe all that. 
You, you talk about prosperity. You talk about harvesting a vision. You, you talk about God meeting needs in your life and, and, and miracles and abundance. I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not really sure I can wrap my faith around that. I, I'm, I'm just not really sure I believe in all that prosperity stuff. I just don't believe that a miracle is going to happen in my life. I just don't believe that this God is going to provide for me. You know what I believe? I believe you're absolutely right. Miracles of God are never going to happen in your life because you don't believe. But you know what? The person that's sitting right next to you might be firmly believed. And the same teaching, same instruction, same impartation of the Holy Spirit that you don't believe and you don't receive launches something inside of their heart. They not only believe it, but they latch their faith onto it and they receive it. Because your expectation is not only going to be seen, it's got to also be believed. Young man, I got to say this carefully that I know God was really working in his life at one time. He was sitting under teaching, sitting under instruction, sitting under some very important mentorship in his life at a strategic time. Someone else stepped in. I'm not critical of anybody. I'm just trying to give you an illustration. Someone else stepped in and said, oh, you better be careful about all that kind of teaching you're getting over there at Family First. You know, some of that stuff's a little bit radical. Yeah, it's called a radical root. And it goes down and finds water in it till it produces a harvest. You better be careful of some of that radical stuff, you know. It's a little bit overboard. You got you to, you know, we're all just supposed to be broke, busted, and disgusted. We're supposed to live in the land of FUD, fear, unbelief, and doubt, you know. You get in that expectation. You get in that prosperity stuff. You, you know, if you get too much money, you might not love Jesus as much. I've got news for you. If I get a little bit more money, I'll probably love Jesus even more than I do now. And one thing is for sure, I'll certainly be able to do more for the work of his kingdom because I've got enough to fill my assignment to help other people fulfill their assignment and he wrote me a letter one time and said well pastor Coates I I just don't believe all that stuff I, I, I just don't believe that sowing a seed can bring a favor of God in my life of increase and prosperity and that's probably about the last time I talked to him to be honest with you I just kind of wonder how all that unbelief is working out for him right now and I'm not critical at all I'm just telling you the truth you've got to believe not my faith I can't do a miracle for you I can't speak magic words. I I can't give you a special formula. All I can do is encourage you and give you an example. But somewhere along the line, you're the person that's got to put the seed in the ground and believe in the supernatural power of God that when you sow with expectation, God is going to use your faith to produce a miracle harvest in your life. Listening to prosperity teaching isn't going to bring prosperity into your life. Attending a prosperity church isn't going to bring prosperity into your life. Uh, Merely saying amen in a prosperity service isn't going to bring prosperity in your life. What's going to release prosperity in your life is listening and obeying an instruction of the voice of the Holy Spirit and believing with all of your heart because you've got to believe it to receive it. Number three, are you ready for number three? That gets only better. It only gets better. Not only must your expectation be clearly seen and firmly believed, it must be Continually spoken. You have got to talk the vision that you want to receive into your life. Put up the verse, death and life. This is Proverbs 18, 21. Death and life are in what? The power of the tongue. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. How many believe that? You have got to begin to speak like a receiver. Like a reaper. Here are things that you have got to learn to say. And when I say say, I don't mean think. I I don't mean meditate. I I don't mean whisper. I mean speak out loud. You say, Pastor, doesn't God already know my thoughts? Why do I need to speak these things out loud? Yeah, God does know your thoughts. But sometimes you need to talk it out loud so the devil can hear you. And sometimes you need to talk it out loud so that you can hear yourself and attach your faith to it. And here are some things that you've got to start saying. I am a receiver. I am a reaper. I have a harvest coming into my life. I am expecting God to bless me. I have an earnest expectation of the destiny of God on my life because death and life are in the power of the tongue. And the words that I speak, they're like seeds that are growing continually over time. And my words are going to produce the harvest that's going to come back into my life. I had a revelation on this verse yesterday. Yesterday. 
Not two weeks ago, not five years ago. Yesterday, thinking about this service. And God said, Proverbs 18, 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue. I said, yeah, Lord, that's a great verse. Death and life is in the power of the tongue. He said, what's the rest of that say? I said, well, it says something about fruit. Oh, yeah. And those who love it will eat its fruits. All of a sudden, a light bulb came on. Aren't you glad you know your pastor isn't so dumb that he can still learn a few new things? <laughs> in other words, what are the fruits? I know your fruits is not supposed to be plural, but there's an S up there, so that's why I'm saying it. Fruits. What's producing the fruits? The seed. What are the seeds? The seeds are the words. Words of death are producing a, a, a fruit of death. Words of life are producing a fruit of life. Because death and life are in the power of the tongue. If I'm speaking death producing words i'm sowing death creating seeds and i'm scheduling a deathful harvest for my future i'm saying death to my prosperity i'm saying death to my healing i'm saying death to my deliverance i'm saying death to my anointing but if i can get a hold of a spirit of life and begin to speak words of life i'm sowing seeds of life and i'm scheduling a harvest of life in my life because death and life are in the power of the tongue and here's what some of you have got to learn to do and i don't mean to say this hard but I just want to really communicate it. You have got to learn to use your mouth to manage your mind. Come on, listen to this. Use your mouth to manage your mind. Wrap your head around that for a second. Use your mouth to manage your mind. It's not the other way around. You don't use your mind to manage your mouth. I know Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. I understand that. What's in the heart is going to come out through the mouth. So if what's in the heart needs to be guided... Why don't you start managing the words that are in your mind by the words that you produce from the lips of your mouth? Manage your mind by your mouth. Some of you have great faith, but you destroy your own faith with your own words. Some of you are believing God for great things. You have a heart of purity. You have a sincere desire. Your mind is in the right place. Some of you are enduring. Oh, I mean to tell you what, some of you are leather skin. I mean, you've been enduring for years. But the problem is your expectation is not helping you maintain this steadfastness in your life. Because about the time God gets ready to bring a harvest in your life, you start speaking death to your seed. You start saying things like, well, I know that I sowed that seed five months ago. And Dr. Smalley, when he was here he said that if I'd mark off on the calendar 90 days and believe that in 90 days God would bring me a supernatural miracle but nothing's happened in my life I think I'm going to go dig that seed up I think I'm going to go back to Pastor Coates and ask him if I can have my 59 cents back because it didn't produce the harvest that I expected to, go, to give into my life you know I think a lot of times people have giver's remorse how many have ever had giver's remorse let me ask you another question how many know what the Bible says about liars all right. I know you don't want to raise your hand. We've all had givers remorse. You know, the Bible says God loveth a cheerful giver. You know who I think a cheerful giver is? I think a cheerful giver is the one that's never given till it hurts. If you're still too happy about it, you should have doubled it. Because when it starts to hurt, then, then it becomes a seed of significance. And when you disrespect, you dishonor your seed, you, you dig it up. I, I want my $50 back. I, I tease about this all the time. I'm sorry to repeat this. But, you know, it's like the husband that says, well, sweetheart, if I wouldn't have put that $100 in the offering today, I'd take you out to lunch. He knows he put that $100 in the offering, and he knows he can't get it back. So what she ought to say to him is, you liar. Last Sunday morning, you had $100 in your pocket. You didn't take me out to lunch last week. So what makes me think you'd take me out to lunch this week? But you dishonor your seed. You disrespect it. You try to say it. And what happens? Your words are cursing your harvest. The words that come out of your mouth are destroying the future. So you've got to manage your mind with your mouth. Use your words to create the harvest that you want to receive. How many can handle one more? Amen. Your expectation must be consistently sown into. Now, I know I get excited and I get animated and I try to communicate the best I can. I really want to try to stay focused and want you to just really listen. I may not be able to be quite as entertaining on this, but I want you to really listen to me. You have to speak 
in faith and you have to consistently sow into the expectation. I really believe that the greatest thing that people can do to keep expectation alive, to keep a dream alive, is to continue to sow into that dream. I'll give you a couple of illustrations if I can. If you expect to get a university degree, I expect someday to be given a university degree of, of a, a doctorate. I expect some way to get a master's degree. I expect someday to get a, 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 a bachelor's degree. What, whatever uh, expectation might be in your life. The best thing that you can do to keep expectation alive is what? Continue to sow into that expectation. And know that every time you pass a test, when you graduated from the eighth grade to the freshman year in high school, what were you doing? You're sowing into that dream that someday you're going to be a Ph.D. And when you graduate from high school and you go enroll in the freshman year of college and you pass that very first uh, exam in your freshman year and it happens to everybody in college because they get their first essay exam. They've never seen an essay exam before and they lose their mind and they get their grade back and they barely pass. You need to realize that that's a seed that you're continually sowing into your expectation that someday you're going to get your degree. And then you pass the third year of college. You enroll in, in your uh, 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 graduate school. And every day you're sowing into the dream and you're keeping the dream alive. Yeah. Let me just illustrate. Maybe this is a little bit simpler. For some of the younger people, I'm not saying you're simple, I'm just trying to help communicate here. Maybe you've got a dream someday that you're going to be married to the woman of your dreams. You're going to be married to the wife of your dreams and she's going to be perfect in every way. You've got to be willing to sow into that dream. And realize every time you take her out at an expensive restaurant, not one that has the golden arches, <laughs> not, not the one that serves Happy Meals for $1.99, but I mean the one that serves an expensive meal and you get that uh, check and you write your check to pay that bill at the restaurant, you're sowing into the expectation. You're keeping the dream alive that someday you're going to stand at the altar of God and she's going to say, I do, because you've been sowing into that dream. And you're keeping the dream of the expectation alive. Are you understanding me? And I know that many people, Pastor Meredith, would you come? It'll help me here close. Sometimes God's people have sown into a dream and it's never happened. You've sown a seed and pointed it towards a particular harvest and it's never been fulfilled. And you say, Pastor Coates, then what should I do in that situation? Should I throw my hands up in despair and say, well, I guess God never intended to meet my need. I guess my miracle is not going to happen. No, my suggestion to you is put new seed in the soil because that new seed is going to invigorate the soil and it's going to awaken the dead dream. And God is going to keep your expectation alive. I've been sowing seeds for years. Can I tell you very personal? Here at Family First, and I've been here for 20 years, we have sown seed into missionaries around the world by the tune of hundreds of thousands of dollars. I'm not trying to impress you. I'm not trying to uh, look good. I'm just trying to make a point. Over, In fact, we, we accomplished this about five years ago. About five years ago, after a 15-year point, we eclipsed that barrier of having over the years sown one million dollars into missionaries in 15 to 16 years. Every time I write a check to the Division of World Missions, the Assemblies of God, or other missionaries I support, I'm sowing a seed. You know what I'm doing? I'm sowing for missionaries around the world to bring people to Jesus Christ and see revivals. But every seed I sow has a string attached to it. Because I believe what you make happen for others, God will make happen for you. And I believe that if I have faithfully, consistently sowed one million dollars to missionaries around the world to bring people to Jesus, one of these days there's going to be people that are streaming into these build, into these, into these uh, seats, streaming into this building, and they're going to come run them up to this altar, and they're going to be giving their heart and their life to Jesus Christ and getting saved and filled with the Holy Spirit because I've facilitated it for others, and God, what I've made happen for others, God is going to make happen for me. 
Every month when I write my missionary support check, it keeps my dream alive. Some of you need to sow fresh seed into a dream so that you can resurrect the harvest and keep that dream alive. Can you put one more verse on the screen for me? This is 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 10. And I want to talk about this for just a minute. You see, it's always difficult to know when God blesses us, whether what God gives us is our harvest or whether it's more seed. How many of you be like five more minutes to, to, to teach on, on something here? Very important. When God blesses you with something, how do you discern whether what God has given you is the harvest? In other words, this is what you're praying for. This is what you're believing for. This is going to meet your need. It's going to fulfill your, your retirement obligations. It's going to pay off your mortgage. It's, it's, if it's the harvest, then God wants you to be blessed by it. But how do you discern whether it's your harvest or whether it is seed that you can re to create a larger harvest? The answer to that question lies in the size of your expectations. Because this is what the verse says. He who supplies. How many know God is a supplier? He's a provider. What does he provide? That's what the question asks. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food. If your vision, if your dream is to get bread for food, then God will meet all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. When I sowed that corn seed last Sunday morning, one corn seed went into the soil. It could produce one corn stalk with on average three ears, each of the three ears having on average 650 to 750 kernels of corn and one stalk producing 2,000 kernels of corn. I could have a wonderful Sunday afternoon lunch on Indiana sweet corn, hot and buttered and salted and it would be delicious. If my vision is to have a meal, God will give me bread for food. If my vision is to have more seed for more sowing, instead of eating my seed, I replant my seed. If I replanted the 2,000 kernels of corn, one more time they would produce a harvest of approximately 2.2 million kernels of corn. That would be enough to feed me and feed you probably for the rest of our lives. Or if we replanted the 2.2 million kernels of corn third time, three times planting, third time exponentially, the harvest would be nearly incomprehensible because of the result of the harvest to God. So how do you discern? Is this my harvest or is this seed for the sower? This is the answer that I propose to you. Asked for the voice of an instruction from the Holy Spirit. I'm talking to you just as practical as I possibly can. My wife and I have sat for hours and we've discussed. God has brought blessing into our lives. Is this for us to keep? Is this to us put towards our retirement? Is this for our, our future harvest? Or is this something for us to re and put back into the work of God till God can continue to increase it? And here's the answer to that question. You listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit because I firmly believe and I've tried to um, always live up to this conviction to never stand here and say you should give X number of dollars you know X number of, of amount or speak to particular people but always ask you to ask the Holy Spirit for his instruction the Bible says my sheep know my voice and they will not follow the voice of a stranger And if you ask for an instruction of the Holy Spirit and he says, that's your harvest, keep it, be blessed, enjoy it, do so. Because the Bible says he giveth all good things to enjoy. I love to irritate religious devils with that verse of scripture. God will give us all good things to enjoy. That's right out of the word of God. However, if the Holy Spirit says, that's not necessarily your harvest because I have a bigger harvest on my mind and so what I want you to do is to the taking bread for food I want you to take seed for the sower and put it back in the ground one more time and see what I can do with a supernatural planting of the seed that I've provided in your and the answer to that is here the voice of the Holy Spirit I want our ushers to come this morning and uh, 
This is no surprise. We don't do this every Sunday. If you're a guest today, just, I guess, be thankful that you got here on a lucky day. It's just your lucky day. Come on, somebody. But the ushers are going to give you an envelope. And I'd like for you guys, if you'll give everyone in the room, everyone in the house, one of these envelopes. We prepared it especially for today. It has our logo on. Go ahead and just, just pass out the envelopes to the people. Hold an envelope in your hand. I'd, everyone take one. I'd appreciate it. If you've not seen this, what we're doing right now is all through this fall. We started on September the 1st. September the 1st, we released this $25,000 challenge. Believing that from September 1 until the end of the year, and now we're at the point where we really believe it's the day that God's going to do it. If we reach the $25,000 just for our building fund, a dear friend of this church has wanted to match that and sow another $25,000. The $25,000 would become fifty dollars to go right off of our mortgage and get the indebtedness of Family First under the $275,000 mark. Right now it's about three hundred and ten. dollars Get it about to the $275,000 mark or less. And so we've been doing this, and so far we're at about the $12,000 mark. And we sowed seed in the early service. Omar, if you take those baskets and maybe just kind of spread them around here on the, on the steps. The people that were in the first service put their seeds into the baskets, and I've not looked at it. I've not counted. I don't know how much is there. But I do believe that God is going to meet this need today. And I believe that's going to happen by us hearing the voice of the instruction of the Holy Spirit. So just before we receive this seed, I'm going to ask us to pray and just ask the Holy Spirit. Can I say this? You don't necessarily need to raise your hands. That that may not be the appropriate thing to do. It's, It's not a comparison thing. But I want to ask you in your heart. How many of you, if the Holy Spirit speaks to you and gives you a specific instruction, you'll obey the instruction of the Holy Spirit? If that is true, then I know that God will give us a great breakthrough today because He's a God that fulfills His Word. I've been praying about this. I've been praying about it for weeks. And I really believe, and I don't know this doesn't apply to everybody. It may not apply to you may not apply to the person sitting next to you. I don't know. But I really believe that God spoke to me in in prayer and said there's around five people. There may be more, but there's around five people that want to sow a $1,000 seed today towards this, this goal. If that's you, just hear that voice of instruction and believe that as you sow that seed in expectation, God is going to bless you abundantly. There may be one that does a lot more. When we printed these envelopes, I, 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 put, that, I, I put those amounts on there. Not to, to say that's what you have to do, but there might be someone that wants to do more than that. 5,000, 10,000, whatever the Holy Spirit says. But I really felt like in prayer, the Lord said there's at least five people. And that may be you, may not be you, I don't know. But there'd be five or so that would want to sow a thousand dollar seed and another five or so that would like to sow a five hundred dollar seed the rest of us we put seeds of honor it'll all meet the need i want to say one more thing thank you for your patience today i appreciate it immensely any seed that is sown in obedience to an instruction from the holy spirit is a seed of honor I want to repeat that. I want you to hear it. What determines whether or not the seed that you sow is one of honor is whether or not it is sown in obedience to the voice of the Holy Spirit. An amount has nothing to do with it. Money is not the issue. Turn to your neighbor and say, money is not the issue. The amount is not what God is looking for. What God is looking for is the obedience of the heart. Any seed sowed in obedience to a voice of instruction from the Holy Spirit is a seed of honor. I want to say that because not everyone is on the same level. But however, everyone has the same potential to honor God today in their faithfulness and in their faith because they're obeying the voice of the instruction of the Holy Spirit. I want to pray. And then what we're going to do is we're going to stand. 
and uh, we're going to fill out our, our seed. You're going to prepare your seed. I'm going to have you come and lay your seed in these baskets. And as you come and as you lay your seed in these baskets, when we're all done, I'm going to collect all the baskets. I'm going to hold them in my hand. And we're going to lift them up and we're going to sanctify the seed that's going into the soil today. And we believe that it's going to go into the ground and it's going to schedule a miracle harvest in your life. So if you'll bow with me and pray, and then we'll prepare our seed. We'll sow it to the Lord. We'll sanctify the seed together today. And we'll rejoice in this house that we know the miracle of God's multiplication is going to be released in our lives. Father God, today, I ask that you would just speak to the voice, to the hearts of your people by the voice of your Holy Spirit and give a divine instruction because it's on obedience to the voice of a divine instruction that we are honoring you Lord, and I declare freedom. I I curse any thoughts of comparison. I come against any idea right now of insignificance. Anybody in the room that is thinking that their seed is not going to be as important as somebody else's because of the size of the amount, I curse that lie in the name of Jesus. And I declare that every seed is a seed of honor. And it's received with great appreciation in the heart of the Father. And it schedules the increase of the favor of God in your life. Father, speak to the hearts of your people. And as we prepare to obey you, we're scheduling the release of your favor in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So go ahead if you need to take a minute and uh, prepare your seed. If you have your seed prepared, go ahead and stand. Let's all stand together. And I want you, as you prepare your seed, to just start moving this direction. And uh, just go ahead and start putting your seed in the baskets. If you could, if you could stay up here, I would appreciate it. After you drop your seed in, just stay up here for a minute. I had mentioned before that I wanted to give a thumb drive to everybody that sows seed to this project. And it's a video recording of all the Money Talk teachings. We ordered the thumb drives and they're not here yet. So as soon as they get here, we'll give them to you. The ushers have one of these little cards that we prepared. Just hold one of these little cards. And when we get the thumb drives ready, we'll have them in the cafe and you can stop by and and pick up a thumb drive but i just want everybody to come this direction and 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 like i said if instead of going back to your seats uh if you'll just take a minute and stay up here okay just everybody gather on up here close and we're going to collect these seeds and we're going to lift them up to the lord we're going to sanctify them today every seed sown in a heart of faith is a seed of honor it's a seed of obedience to the instruction of the voice of the holy spirit people are still coming I tell you what, this is a solemn moment. It's a solemn moment because what's happening right now is our hearts are being filled with an expectation of what God is going to do. How many believe that God has something in store for you in 2019? You know what I believe? I believe unsaved loved ones are going to be coming to Jesus because seed has been pointed towards their salvation. I believe that healings are going to come. I I believe that a great explosion of evangelism is going to hit Central Florida. Yesterday, Pastor Omar, you would have been off the chain. At the youth conference, they talked about how Central Florida, centered in Orlando, is going to be a center. And we're not very far from Mickey Mouse House. Come on, somebody. But, But Orlando is going to be a center of evangelism in the next number of years. This has been prophesied and confirmed in the hearts of so many of the prophets and evangelists. And I believe that we're going to experience right here in our area a phenomenal revival and evangelism of souls, people coming to Jesus exponentially. Souls are being scheduled by the harvest. Butch, if if you could help me pick up these uh, baskets and and, uh, and, uh, hand them to me, and I'd like to hold these. Thank you, Bob. I'd like to hold these baskets. I don't mean to be silly, but I want you to get this. Anybody get it? I've got an expectation. I'm, I'm creaning my neck. I'm stretching my neck. I'm thrusting forth my heart. 
into the expectation of what God is going to do. Hold somebody by the hand wherever you're standing. Just hold somebody by the hand. You don't have to all be like one un, unbroken thing, but just be connected with somebody. Father God, right now in the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace, Lord, we sow with expectation. Expectation is what keeps our feelings under focus. It's what keeps our our feelings from running away from us. My feelings are not going to determine my faith. My expectation is going to determine my faith. And I'm going to manage my mind with my mouth. The words that I speak create the life that I live into and the expectation. Father, I release the harvest over the people. Harvest, Lord, of finances. Harvest, Lord, of souls. Harvest, Lords, of health. Harvest, Lords, of the salvation of their loved ones. I curse every lying devil that will try to tell them today that God is not going to fulfill their expectation. I declare them today as they sow with an expectation, they're scheduling a miracle that's going to come pass in their life. We give you honor. We give you thanks. We receive the seed now and we dedicate it to you.